Are you all wondering what is topic 2 and 12? Don't fret, we've got you covered. Topic 2, atomic theory, starts with the atom. The atom consists of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are positively charged, plus 1. Neutrons are neutral, and the electrons are negatively charged, minus 1. Think of the atom like this. The nucleus is a beehive, and it's made of positive honey and neutral honeycomb. And surrounding the outside are buzzing negative bees. In case you didn't get that, this is a typical atom of helium. Protons and neutrons account for the mass of the atom and are both 1 12th of a carbon-12 atom versus an electron, which is only 1 2,000th. This is called relative mass. The mass number of an atom relative to a 1 12th, 1 12th of a carbon-12 atom is denoted with A. The number of protons in an atom is the atomic number, and it's denoted with a Z. Careful! Not all atoms of the same element have the same mass, though. Atoms of the same element with different masses are called isotopes. They have different mass because they have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. You know that big table of elements with all the obscure letters on it? Well, to read it, you need to know the atomic symbol. An A, mass number, at the top of an X, which represents the element, and a Z, the atomic number, at the bottom of the X, is the atomic symbol. I'm sure you're all thinking, well, we know how to find the number of protons, but how do we find the number of electrons and neutrons? Well, since neutrons and protons make up the mass of the atom, then the mass number A minus the atomic number Z equals the number of neutrons. And for electrons, the atomic number minus the charge of the atom equals the number of electrons. Remember those isotopes from before? Well, as well as having the same number of protons, they have the same chemical properties, but as well as having a different number of neutrons, they also have different physical properties, such as density, which is mass over volume, and rate of diffusion, and melting slash boiling point. Don't quite understand? Here are some useful examples. Carbon-14 versus carbon-12 is used for radioactive dating. Cobalt-60 is used for chemotherapy and iodine-125 and iodine-131 are both used for medical traces. Got it? Good. High five! Next, we should probably talk about the mass spectrometer. A sample of an element with different isotopes is inserted into the mass spectrometer where it is heated by a coil and converted into gas. This conversion is called vaporization. Easy, huh? Next, a high-energy beam removes electrons from the atom, leaving only positive ions. This is called ionization. That's not too difficult. Next is acceleration. The positive ions go through oppositely charged plates, and that makes them move really fast. Deflection by a magnet curves the pathway of each atom depending on their mass. If their mass to charge ratio is smaller, then there is much more to bend, and these atoms end up on the outside curve. Picture a track. And the lighter atoms with high charges bend easier on the inside of the curve. The last step is detection, and the atoms collide with plates that register where they hit, so they can count the frequency of each isotope. Hmm. Moving on. After the mass spectrometer, you can see how abundant an isotope is, right? So how about putting it into a nice bar graph? Using the relative atomic mass, which is the mass of an atom of an element relative to 1 12th of a carbon-12 atom, we can graph it out. To calculate the average atomic mass, which is what you see on the periodic table and is the weighted average of all isotopes of an element based on its abundance, you can take the mass times the percent abundance and add it to the other isotope's mass times its abundance, and you get the average atomic mass. When jumping from high energy levels to low ones, emit energy in the form of light. The speed of light in meters per second equals wavelength in meters times frequency in hertz. And energy equals Planck's constant times frequency. How can we see colors? That's chemistry too. The electromagnetic spectrum includes all frequencies of light. The light with the highest energy and the smallest length are on the left side of the spectrum and go from gamma to x-rays to UV to visible to infrared to microwaves and radio waves. 
Radio waves have the smallest energy and frequency, but the longest wavelengths. That's probably why can we why we can hear radio from a great distance. Ha ha ha. Now pay attention. There are two types of spectrums. The continuous spectrum shows all frequencies across the spectrum, while a line spectrum shows distinct frequencies emitted by an atom. The hydrogen emission spectrum represents all the different energy levels present in hydrogen. The levels converge eventually. The electron with electricity jumps up and comes down. If the electron comes down to two, then it emits visible light. And if it goes up down to one, it gives off UV light. And an electron jumping to infinity is the ionization energy, the amount of energy to lose one electron. This is it's the Bohr model. The number line version of the hydrogen emission spectrum is reversed with UV light on the right and infrared on the left. At each section, the lines converge. When you jump sublevels, sub it requires different amounts of ionization energy. Electron arrangement is essential to chemistry. The periodic table of elements will help you find the electron arrangement of the atom. The row in which the element is in represents the number of rings of electrons the atom has, and the column in which it's in represents the number of valence electrons, electrons in the last ring the atom has. If the charge is plus one, then the atom actually has one less electron than that, and if the, and if the charge is minus one, then it actually has one more than that, and so on. Topic 12 is the atomic structure. To explain how we know that energy levels and sublevels exist in atoms, we can see that the ionization changes from each sublevel and each level, the huge gaps indicating a change in level. There are four different orbitals, S, P, D, and F. S has two sublevels, P has six sublevels, D has 10 sublevels, and F has a lot. The S orbital is just a circle around the two primary axes. The first P sublevel is a horizontal 8. The second P sublevel is a vertical 8. And the third P sublevel is a diagonal 8. There are three rules for electron configuration. The off-bow principle, Hund's rule, and the Pauli exclusion principle. The off-bow principle states that you must fill the lowest energy levels first. The Hund's rule says that you have to fill orbitals of the same sublevel first. And the Pauli exclusion principle says that there is a maximum of two electrons in an orbital that spin in opposite directions. This is an off-bow diagram. It is the visual representation of an electron configuration. See, first you fill the S sublevels, then the P sublevels, then another S, and however many P's there are, which sulfur only has four electrons in the third P sublevel. The electron configuration is very similar. You number each sublevel and however many electrons are in the sublevel, you denote with a superscript. Be careful though. The rows of chromium and copper are exceptions in their electron configurations. Chromium should be 4s1 and 3d5, as copper should be 4s1, 3d10. Isn't chemistry fun and easy? And aren't Nikila such good teachers, even better than Mr. Chong? That's all, folks.